there is a story that during one of andrew jackson's many trips around this country promoting his vision of america near the start of his second term as the seventh president of the united states in the spring of 1833 he met samuel slater slater was in his later years and ill at the time but president jackson really wanted to meet the man who was so instrumental in developing manufacturing here in america it was reported that Jackson said to Sam Slater, I understand you taught us how to spin, so as to rival Great Britain and her manufacturers. You set all these thousands of spindles at work, which I have been delighted in viewing, which have made so many happy by lucrative employment. And the story goes that Samuel Slater made what became his most famous quote when he said, yes, sir, Mr. President, I suppose that I gave out that psalm and they've been singing to the tune ever since. And indeed, that tune was sung heartily here along the Blackstone River. From the first Slater adaptation of the Arkwright machines in 1790, which carried 72 spindles at the mill by the falls of the Pawtucket, the Blackstone Valley would lead the way in America's industrial revolution. This is undoubtedly the reason that President Jackson called Slater the father of American manufacturers. Hi, I'm Chuck Arning, National Park Service Ranger here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. As the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution, the National Heritage Corridor here has recently had its boundaries expanded by Congress to include several new communities. Now, these new communities have always been part of the Blackstone Valley and have played an important role in the watershed of the Blackstone River system. Yet, for some reason, they weren't included in the original authorization by Congress. Now, I don't know why that happened, but I do know that the history and heritage of these new communities played an integral part in the development of the Blackstone Valley as a world leader in manufacturing. So I tell you what, why don't you join me as we explore these new communities and discover the mill ties that bind. village of Oakland, one of the many picturesque villages that make up the town of Burrowville, Rhode Island. And as you can tell from the mill housing behind me, it's very typical of the Blackstone River Valley. Now, if you really want to learn about a particular community, you've got to spend some time in that community. You've got to talk to the residents of the community. And if you're like me, you also make sure you bring along some of your National Park Service ranger friends, because they do know their history. And that's exactly what I'm going to do as we go exploring into those new communities that have been added to the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. Here in Rhode Island, Gloucester, Burrowville, and Smithfield. And in Massachusetts, town of Leicester, and the remaining portion of the city of Worcester. So join me and get ready for some good stories. Hi, this is Ranger Suzanne Buchanan here today in Leicester, Massachusetts. And I'm going to make a card of connection for you. Imagine if we could take all the history that's been woven into the Blackstone Valley and run it out on one continuous piece of fabric. All the stories it could tell, it would go on for miles and miles and miles. And if I could, at time, pull one string out at a time and each finely spun string tell a story, it would begin in 1790, Leicester, Massachusetts, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, 51 miles apart. How do they make the connection? Well, it started in 1790 with Sam Slater. Sam Slater had arrived in Pawtucket with all his wonderful ideas of the Arkwright spinning and carding machines. And he began to construct the machines, though Sam had no trouble with the actual framing and the gearing of the machines. Sam had trouble with actually positioning the carding machine to run successfully, for the carding cloth kept bunching up. Word spread up the Blackstone Valley to Leicester, Massachusetts, to a man named Pliny Earl. Pliny Earl had successfully been manufacturing carding fabric for several years. 
the process of carding, and I have one of Pliny's original cards here, is to take a leather backing and you insert wire fillets through it. The process to card is you take fiber, be it cotton or wool, and today I'm going to demonstrate with wool, and you place it on the hand cards. You go in opposite directions, and the process to card is to elongate the fibers, to get the fibers going all in one position, in one direction, to get them as long as you can. It's kind of like untangling the knots in your hair. Once you get the process, as you can see, this was all done by hand. This took time. Plenty Earl and Sam Slater, they wanted to take this hand process and make a machine that would mass produce it, which meant the more cards that could be created, the more fat fibers that could be combed, the more yarn could be spun. So Pliny Earl traveled to visit Sam Slater in the fall of 1790, and he met with Sam and a, another gentleman, Sylvanus Brown. Sylvanus Brown was also a well-known artisan and craftsman in Pawtucket. And the three gentlemen together uh, worked to position the angles of the cutting machine so that they would successfully spin and intertwine off the drums. Uh, they all had their different ideas and how the uh, cutting angle should be positioned, though neither of the gentlemen have been credited with uh, successfully getting the cutting machine to work. One date that stands out in history is December 20th, 1790, for that was the date when it all came together, when their, their, all their efforts were realized, the cutting machine began to function with the spinning machines, and this is the date that um, could possibly be the birth date of the American Industrial Revolution. Back in 1790, a Lester resident invented a way to make hand cards by machine in uh, the machine card industry in Leicester took off. Well, at one time, uh, Leicester had 17 factories manufacturing uh, cards to comb wool, and uh, it was the major employer in town. And uh, mill owners, of course, uh, made for it, uh, substantial money. Some fortunes were made in that industry. Leicester was probably the major supplier worldwide for uh, machine cards. Whenever there was water power available, the mill industries thrived, and subsequently the town broke up into uh, villages. There was uh, Manville, Lakeside, Leicester Center, Cherry Valley, Rochdale, and Greenville were all villages within the town. All boasted their own little fire stations and uh, stores and so on, and were separate communities, so to speak. In the early days, uh, it was mostly uh, English, Scotch and Irish, uh, the English being the mill owners and uh, your Scotch-Irish being uh, your, your workers, your mill workers. Uh, most of your mill owners lived in uh, the center area and a lot of the mill workers lived in Rochdale and Cherry Valley. Rochdale uh, was originally called Clapville and so many people from Rochdale, England moved into the area to uh, work in the mills that they changed the name to Rochdale. So at its height, what was the town of Leicester was uh, a huge uh, employer of people in the carding industry. What happened? Well, two things happened. Uh, around 1890, uh, the American Card Clothing Company bought out all the machine card mills uh, in the area and moved the industry down, ch uh, down south where the labor was cheaper. They didn't have to pay the hourly rate to their workers that they did up here. And, uh, the city of Worcester started buying water rights to the mill ponds on Kettle Brook and diverted the water flow to their reservoirs for drinking water and so on and depriving the mills downstream of their water power and basically put them right out of business. I don't know too many unusual stories, but uh, yeah, they're probably the same as as any other New England town, they had the separate villages and the competition between the villages and, and competition between the various fire companies. They were almost like separate towns, but it wasn't. It was all the town of Leicester, but there was a village pride was probably the most unusual and colorful thing about the villages.
Many people have been asking us why we added these new communities to the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor, especially since some of these towns aren't even on the Blackstone River. But there's some very good answers to those questions. Hi, I'm National Park Service Ranger Kevin Kleiberg, and I'm standing along the banks of the Branch River here in Oakland, a village in the town of Burrowville. These new communities share not only a common heritage with the towns of the Blackstone Valley, but they also form part of its watershed. Here in Burrowville, the major river is the Clear River, which forms up at Wallam Lake in the northwest corner of town, right along the Connecticut and Massachusetts borders. The river then flows eastwards through Burrowville, and along the way, several other tributaries come into it, including the Pasco River, the Nipmuc River, and Mowry Brook. Until it reaches here at Oakland, where the Chapacha River flows into it, and together they become the Branch River, which continues flowing eastward on into the Blackstone River in the town of North Smithfield. During its 15-mile journey from Wallam Lake on down to the Blackstone, the Clear Branch River system drops about 325 feet, which provides a wonderful source of water power for many mills here along the way. In Burrowville, though, because the river, although it has a lot of drop, is a fairly narrow and shallow river, most of the mills here were small mills as opposed to the larger mills that we see on the, on the bigger Blackstone River. Eventually there are about 14 mill villages here in town and most of them specialize in woolen products as opposed to the cotton mills which are more common on the larger Blackstone. The reason for that was fairly simple. Uh, with the smaller mills and smaller power, uh, it was easy to turn a profit on a more specialized woolen mill than it was on the larger cotton mills. A couple years after Slater started, I know that around 1802, we had a cotton mill that started out where the Lincoln Mill site is in Pasco. We had uh, cotton mills in several areas of the town, but eventually we worked into the woolen mills. We raised our own sheep here and started the woolen industry here. Uh, one of the reasons why was the availability of all this water. And every time you had a little stream coming or you had a little pond or something, a village would work up around it. And that's how we got the village entities for Burrowville. Every little place at the stop where they could put a mill and a little dam, they did. And the villages just grew up right around that area. Uh, in the 1840s and 50s, I believe it is, uh, we had 14 woolen and worsted mills here in the middle half of the 18th century, 1800s. When the Industrial Revolution started, we were ready. We had our water, and the water powered the mills. As soon as the mills started operating and they saw how much water was here. In fact, one of the newspaper articles I read gave a survey, and it said that Burville was getting so big with the railroads and the trolleys and everything else that the population was going to expand, and they foresaw that by the year 2000, it would be bigger than Providence. Of course, it never happened, but uh, we were just expanding right and left. It was, it was unbelievable. Pat, Austin Levy, an entrepreneur, an interesting person, and he made a major contribution to the village here of Harrisville. Now, what kind of a man was he? People tell me that he would walk through his mills. Now, he owned like five or six different mills around the state and in South Carolina. And he would walk through the mills and greet everyone by, by name, which was totally unusual. He was a very good man. He was a businessman when it had to be a businessman, but he was a real person when it counted. Everybody liked him. He wanted his people to have good houses. He made sure they had sewage over here, they had water. Every place he built in and came into, he made sure his people were taken care of. And I know that one of my brothers used to work like three hours on a Saturday cleaning under the, he used to hire the kids from the high school to clean underneath the uh, machines on a Saturday. That's fine, they got a few dollars for that, but along with everybody else who worked in Levy's Mills at Christmas, they got a Christmas bonus, they got a big care package, I call it, with all kinds of goodies in. And on their birthday, he also gave them a little extra, too. So he remembered everyone who worked at his mill, not just the managers, not just the, the loom fixers or anybody, but even the little kids who worked cleaning out underneath the, cleaning up the floors. But he was way ahead of his time.
people think of Japantia don't think of the mills because they came and they went so quickly uh, that they don't associate Japantia with the Blackstone River or with any kind of commerce along the river. All it was was a, a pristine river that ran through the center of town that people used for recreation and things like that. Uh, but it was, Chapachet was such a hub of commerce uh, between 1814 and 1897 that uh, it, was, it was the northern part of uh, the state that was the busiest at this point. Uh, people came here, there were stage stops between here in Connecticut and between here in Worcester. Um, and Chapachet was well known for its cashmere and its fine woolens. Well, from what I understand, it's, it's one of the finest woolen fabrics that are made, the cashmere, that's, that's a desirable, uh, the softness. Um, and it was made for, for quite a number of years uh, within the mills. Um, and then after that, because of the, the hardship, uh, things began to become, when it became well known and mills began uh, springing up everywhere, uh, I think Chapachet, that's when Chapachet began to lose some of its popularity because it was not on the main uh, railroad lines that uh, the, the mills began to make do with what they had. And so a lot of them were reduced to uh, weaving shoddy, which is the leftover shorter woolen fibers uh, that, are, that are left over after the long fibers are woven into the finer fabrics. So that the, uh, the shoddy mills were, were um, at that point uh, producing. In fact, I think they used them for the uh, Civil War. The, the shoddy was used for the Civil War uniforms and things like that because they had to make them so quickly. And uh, all of that, like I said, came and went from 1814 to 1897. Since the railroad had bypassed Gloucester or, or Chapachet uh, in the early days, um, if it hadn't bypassed Gloucester and gone to Harrisville, this would have been a bustling mill town uh, right up and probably until uh, the, the late 20s, late 30s, uh, before the Depression. Uh, I think some of the, the, the old stone mill and some of the uh, other sections that are left were functioning up until 1920. But uh, the significant mills burned between uh, 1895 and, and 1897. So it was a great, it, depending on how you look at it, it was a great loss for Chapachet at the time because many jobs were lost. But yet uh, the Chapachet village would not have the quaintness that it has now had the railroad come through. So we're fortunate, I think, in a way that we have the history, but we don't have the congestion. I'm John McNiff. I'm a ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. One of the things, we're in Georgiaville right now, and one of the things that I really like about Georgiaville is that it has a lot of the elements of the development of America still intact here, all the little pieces of the puzzle. You have some of the farming houses from the 1700s. You have some of the early mill housing from the 1830s, the beginning of a mill village. And you also have the later housing from when the mill developed, when the mill expanded, and you can see the changing relationship in between the people, the land, and the owners of the mills. The housing in back of us here is from 1813. It's rubble stone construction, and there are four houses in a row that are very, very different from each other, and they resemble English countryside cottages. So what that reflects is you have a small mill, you have English workers coming to work here, coming from farmhouses, the owner is very conscious of making the people comfortable as they come to work here, and the housing reflects that relationship in between owner and worker. As time went on, the, the relationship in between owners and workers changed dramatically. These four houses are a really great example of the Rhode Island system, where a mill owner would take care to bring families in to work for the mill. The original mill, which was the Nightingale Mill, built in 1813, and the later mill, which was built in 1859 by Zachariah Allen, the Georgiaville Mill. And take a look at the relationships in between mill owner and mill worker and how it's reflected in the housing that was provided by the owner for those workers. In 1853, Zachariah Allen doubled the height of the dam on the Wenaskatucket River and built an entirely new mill here at Georgiaville. To go along with that mill, he also built these two buildings in back of me, which were mill worker housing. As you can see, they're also built out of rubble stone, but the major difference in between these and the four cottages that you saw earlier is that these are much more like warehouses, and they weren't designed for families. They were desi designed for individual workers. The one on the left was designed for men. The one on the right was for the women. They were community buildings where they would have a community kitchen. 
Again, it's not families that are here, and it's not family housing. This is warehousing of another commodity that the mill is, mill is gathering here. You have warehouses for your cotton. You have warehouses for your people. It's a reflection of the change in relationship in between the mill owners and the mill workers. The architecture here in Georgiaville and down the river in Esmond are great examples of the changing relationship in between management and labor. And that's all part of the heritage and history of the Blackstone River Valley and the new communities here along the Wenaskwetucket River. Welcome to my favorite building in all of New England. I'm Jack Whitaker, National Park Service Ranger, and this is Mechanics Hall in Worcester, Massachusetts. When I first came to this area some 18 years ago, I was told that Mechanics Hall was a small version of Symphony Hall in Boston. But after doing a little research and some study on it, I think we've got that backwards. Actually, Symphony Hall, which was quite a bit younger than Mechanics Hall, could well be called a slightly larger version of Mechanics Hall, because acoustically, this is one of the finest halls in the world. The Mechanics, the association that built this hall, made an impact throughout the country, throughout the world. There were men who were skillful in trades and crafts. They banded together in the early part of the 19th century to form the Mechanics Association. They ran a library. They ran a school for young apprentices. In fact, one of their leaders, Ichabod Washburn, who was so instrumental in building this hall, came here after his apprenticeship saying, I came with no money but a fortune in my hands. And he did develop that fortune. His strong point was steel and wire, particularly wire. And if you think of a period of time we're dealing with here, the 1850s and 60s into the 70s, when the country was expanding westward, the telegraph wires, the barbed wire that was developed here in Worcester by Washburn and Moan. Ichabod Washburn was very instrumental in the development and the taming of the West. He also was the driving force behind this hall. There are 19 portraits around the walls here. Two of them are of Eldridge Boyden, the architect, and Ichabod Washburn, the uh, chairman of the building commission. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of fascinating stories that have this hall as the basis. One of my favorites is the election of 1912. If you think about this, that in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president. There was only one Democratic president elected for the next 52 years. In 1912, we had President Taft running for re-election. We had President Roosevelt seeking to return to office. And we had the Democrat Woodrow Wilson being challenged by the two of them. And with the split in the Republican Party, uh, Wilson did win the election. But here at Mechanics Hall on April 25th of 1912, President Taft spoke. The next night, former President Roosevelt spoke. And the night after that, future President Wilson spoke. This hall was the scene of many social uh, programs, particularly uh, the women's rights and temperance movement of the mid-19th century. Here in Worcester, they're going to celebrate the 150th anniversary of a woman's rights uh, program in 1850 in the year 2000. And you think of the names of the women who came out of that that program out of those years, the Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Abby Kelly Foster, Lucy Stone, they all spoke here at Mechanics Hall. The Mechanics Association was formed, incorporated in 1842 by the industrialists in the city, the folks who owned the factories and the mills. Um, as time went by, they needed a place to exhibit their inventions and their wares, the things that they manufactured in the, in, um, all throughout the city, including all of central Massachusetts. And they also wanted a place where they could educate the folks who worked for them um, in the mechanical arts, which included everything from bookbinding to wire drawing to drafting, um, as well as in um, the cultural aspects of their lives. All of the mechanics were self-made men. They did not go to Harvard or Yale. They educated themselves. And they believed that everyone should be allowed to have such an education. And they felt compelled to provide it for the folks who worked for them. So they did that in different ways. They gave them classes in the mechanical arts. They provided um, 
cultural events as well, lectures on subjects of the day, um, and musical entertainment and popular entertainment. One of the functions of the hall was to be self-sustaining. The mechanics didn't want to have to spend um, their own money in the upkeep of this building. So it always, uh, we always have rented the facilities. In 1868, Charles Dickens was on his second reading tour of the Americas, his second and last, in fact. And he came here to Mechanics Hall in March. Um, at the time that he arrived, that evening, the New England Poultry Association was setting up their fifth annual convention, which included, of course, live poultry. And they sit up here in Washburn Hall, which is behind us. Upstairs in the Great Hall was where Dickens was to read that night. Well, in those days, there were gas lights in Washburn Hall. And while he was reading, evidently he was reading from the Christmas Carol and something from the Pickwick Papers. And one of the folks who worked here flipped on the lights in Washburn Hall, and all the roosters and so forth thought it was daylight and was time for them to sing. And so they did. And there were, we were always open to the upstairs so you could hear clearly through the windows uh, what was happening on the lower levels and out in the street. And the poultry got louder, and Dickens got louder, and he was talking, I guess, about the uh, ghost of Christmas future and as grim as that was, and the roosters crowed, and it was really pretty terrible, and he hated being here. <laughs> but it was a typical example of a cultural event happening at the same time um, an industrial or agricultural event happened. Now, there's another important theme that uh, was kind of portrayed throughout the building, that is uh, the builders of it, the designers, wanted an American-made institution, didn't they? They were very proud of what they had accomplished, and rightly so. And so they were intent on having this building reflect the state of the art in any of the technical trades, um, and said, we, we don't need to go to Europe for any reason. They, that's even true of the Hook organ. It was uh, called the Worcester organ at that time because it was the people of Worcester and the mechanics who funded the building of the organ. There's 3,500 pipes, and it was built by the Hook Brothers from Boston. Most of the pipe organs of that time was very popular to use pipe organs instead of a full concert orchestra. Um, most they sent over to uh, Europe to find folks to build the organs, but uh, Ichabod Washburn, who was then president of the association, said, no, no, we don't need to go there. We can do it from someone here, and they found the Hook Brothers. And, the organ is magnificent, and it still is today. It's just a beautiful instrument. It is the people of the Blackstone Valley who keep their history alive. It is the people of Blackstone Valley who share both the pleasure and responsibility of preserving their history and their heritage. Only through telling their stories can we appreciate what it is to be Americans. Well, this has been Ranger Chuck Arning of the National Park Service here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And as we welcome the new communities into the National Heritage Corridor, it is appropriate that we extend our thanks to the local historical societies, heritage and culture groups, and those hardworking individuals who, through telling their stories, keep our history alive and well. And so until next time, I hope to catch you in the valley. Thank you.